But when you add up the mass of humans and the animals the humans breed to eat, compared to the mass of the rest of the animals on the planet, we're over 95% of the mammal mass on this planet. That's at 8 billion. And there's just no way we can keep on going at this rate without basically wiping out the life support systems that we ourselves depend upon. You argue that orthodox economics or mainstream economics that economists subscribe to now, that neoliberalism, ignores important mm. factors around sustainability and supply constraints. Can you unpack that idea a little bit now about a little bit more or about how these models are broken in your view? Yeah. Well, the simplest thing is they ignore the role of energy and production. They simply think you can whack workers and machines inside a factory and goods will come out the other end. And my little insight was that uh, a worker without energy is a corpse. A machine without energy is a sculpture. If you want to make the worker work on the machine turn, you've got to give them both energy, you know, food for the human and, and oil for the machine fundamentally. And they ignore that. They just leave it out. Now, once you take it into account, if there's a fall in energy availability, there'll be a fall in GDP. And it's virtually one for one. And when they put their stuff into the model, they, and they do include energy their way, they say a 10% fall in energy, maybe a 1% fall in GDP. They are so fundamentally wrong that when it comes to an energy crunch, the real world will tell us the economy's got it wrong and it'll be too late for us to do anything. Well, how do you correctly then incorporate energy into a modern economic model? Well, what you, you just take a look at the data. And if you, there's, there's data showing uh, global, uh, what they call gr a gross world product rather than GDP from 1960 to about 2017, and energy consumption from the same time period, completely different source. You plot the two together and you get a straight line. So you simply have to say, basically, what GDP is, is energy transformed into useful useful work and useful products for us consumers. And so if you don't have energy, you don't have goods either. And then with that realisation, you've got to say, well, how much of our energy is relied upon fossil fuels? And therefore, how vulnerable they are to being forced to use less energy because of climate crises? Well, the answer is 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Now, if we started making a transition to renewables 50 years ago, we might be able to supply 100%. But if we're forced to cut off fossil fuel consumption, then energy consumption will plunge and show, so will our living standards. And, and so this is the basis of, of your model you propose that is a better fit for the modern economy? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very simple argument. GDP is transformed energy. And then if you if you don't have the energy, you don't have the GDP. At the moment, you know, virtually 85% you know, of energy comes from fossil fuels. We're now seeing in you know, a crisis like the flash floods out in western New South Wales just yesterday. Uh, there was drought in America, uh, the drought in Europe as well, a ridiculous heat bubble here. So I'm wearing nothing but a shirt. Uh, uh, this, this weird stuff at some point is going to cause a catastrophe, maybe a crop failure. But we have to take this seriously. And because of economists, we haven't. So what are some of the challenges to your theory from modern day economists who subscribe to neoliberalism? Well, <laughs> I'll give you the worst of it. This is William Nordhaus who got the Nobel Prize in 2018. And he tells us, he completely contradicts me and says that uh, if we had like a six degree increase in global temperature, that would cause, according to his model, an 8.5% fall in GDP. Okay. Now, according to the scientists, I know 6% temperature rise, we'd be there would be no human civilization left. Uh, but the reason he gets a conclusion is he assumes that anything done indoors or undercover will be unaffected by climate change. So, Steve, if we have overshot population in your estimates, where does that leave us? Hanging over a precipice in some ways. We have, we, we, the only way we can actually survive is to reduce our footprint on the planet. And really that actually revolves the rich spending much less than they are right now. We could do a, a lot of this by saying we have to ration what the rich can consume. We've got to cut back the consumption, so that's distribution. But you all have to say, well, we've got to have a planned reduction in population over time. But population is expected to pull back by the end of this century. So isn't that problem solved? If we get to the end of the century at this rate of growth, we're using, for example, so much super, so much phosphate is being consumed that we're actually using up the available supplies of, 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 of phosphate, which our bodies need to, for our muscles to work. We're already doing it now. If we imagine a population continuing with this level of pressure for the next 80 years, <laughs> we're not going to get there. Steve Keane, great to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.